Thank you, Steve. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, just picking up on what Steve said, adding to it just a bit, and then Vikrat and I are going to walk through this presentation. Um, this is a first pass for you all. We're going to be bringing this back to you in October with more detail. We're doing more analysis in terms of what would be needed in terms of voter approval, legislative approval, how it may relate to a regional housing entity to stand this whole thing up. Um, I think all of the ideas, in addition to kind of a spread the pain approach, um, they're also based upon the idea of the CASA compact, that this is about the three Ps and that for CASA to really be successful, we have to move forward on all fronts. And so the revenue ideas are in part um, to support, for example, local government, if they're going to uh, advance development more expeditiously and, and roll back some costs, how would those costs be adjusted for uh, through other revenue? So that's the basic framework. Um, and we're going to try to go through this fairly quickly, um, give you enough detail to think about what's, what's before you, uh, then open it up for questions and, and so forth. So with that, Vikram, you want to sure. get us started? Thanks, Ken. Uh, one other thing I would mention is that we have action plans for each of the ideas that we're going to present today. So uh, we will, uh, as you're leaving, we will give you a packet for that. We didn't want to bring it up front because we were still working on it. But before you leave, please, uh, if you need more details on any of these ideas, you can uh, grab one of those packets. So I think Steve kind of has already covered the first four slides that I was going to present. But uh, again, to go over this, we need new sources of revenue to pay for all of the CASA initiatives. We need some sort of a regional entity to collect uh, and then uh, strategically invest uh, these new revenues. And we need to give this entity some financial tools so that they can fund uh, and build some infrastructure and, um, and housing projects. Uh, this is the slide that I think uh, Steve was referring to in terms of what our, um, what our gap is. And this chart to the left shows really the, the, the gap that we have for uh, building affordable housing. So subsidized housing for low and very low income households based on the current RENA numbers. So just based on that, for affordable housing production, we have a gap of about $1.7 billion annually. Uh, we, we think that's a good ballpark to kind of work towards, as, as Steve said, for the entire CASA um, uh, package of initiatives uh, because it's not too small and it's not too big and something that we can work with, uh, given that we also need to um, raise local uh, revenue, but also, you know, this $1.68 billion uh, assumes that there is a matching amount of money that's coming from the federal and the state uh, sources as well. So this is what Steve was talking about in terms of uh, so uh, local self-help. So 1.5, 1.7 billion dollars seems like a lot, uh, but we have raised more than that for transportation. Uh, so the, if you look at the chart on the right, uh, there are uh, the, to the left of that chart is the affordable housing piece, the amount of money that we currently have for subsidized affordable housing. To the right is what we are currently raising for transportation. The two things that are missing on the left is the regional part and the state part. So I think we can talk about that. But the options we're presenting today uh, is to do with that, uh, uh, that salmon color or the red color, the regional portion of it. Um, it's always good to uh, start with asking, you know, so we've answered the question, how much, uh, but then who's to blame? Uh, and you ask different people, they'll, uh, you know, tell you who is to, you know, who's to blame for this uh, housing crisis. But if you ask the general public and the poll, they say everybody. And that's, again, the guiding principle for uh, the recommendations, as Steve said, uh, we have for you today. It's uh, we think we need to spread the pain. Uh, we think that you can't gang up on one or two sectors. If you are not able to contribute, then you, it's hard for you to ask somebody else to contribute. Uh, for all of these funding ideas, we definitely will need state legislation, so state enabling legislation, uh, and in some cases, voter approval. But we're still working on what that means for each of the ideas that we are presenting today, and we'll come back to you with more details on that. So jumping straight into that, so the, 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 the first idea is this inflation-indexed windfall tax. Again, Prop 13 and our overall tax system um, provides a lot of benefits to homeowners, and that benefit can be passed on from one generation to the next. Uh, and some say that that is one reason we have such a huge wealth inequity within California as well. 
So what this proposal does, and it's described more in the action plan that you will get at the end of the meeting, is uh, it takes a portion of that win of the capital gains, uh, from, and that's the difference between what you bought the home for and what you sold the home for. It takes that portion uh, and, and, and taxes 3.35% on the portion within that, a subset of that, that is not uh, subject to federal taxes. So the first $500,000 that you make on your house as capital gains is exempt from the federal sources for a couple, uh, and for a single, it's 250000 So that's the part that we're looking at. So for that portion, you adjust it for inflation, and then you uh, adjust it for the closing cost, and what's remaining is about 3.35%. So if you sell a house for a million dollars and you bought it for $100,000, um, you know, you take the first 500000 you apply the 3.15% um, to that after you adjust for inflation and um, closing costs, that's the amount that we will be asking. So it would be roughly around like $1,500. Um, the parcel tax, we passed a similar measure uh, in 2016. It was measure AA and that was for $12 a parcel, uh, which would rate, raise $25 million for uh, saving the bay. Uh, so this proposal is asking for four times that much to raise the $100 million. And actually, I forgot to mention that we've adjusted all of the um, tax rates and fees so that we can get to $100 million each for each of the ideas. So to some extent, it's an arbitrary tax rate, and we can uh, look at raising that or dropping that uh, to make it more feasible. Uh, I should uh, also mention that uh, for any regional source, there is always this question of return to source. So if you're raising money from one county, but we are investing it at, a, at the regional level, uh, does that money eventually have to go back to um, that particular county? And that needs to still be resolved. But uh, our proposal, at least for all of these ideas, is that the money goes to a regional pot, and then is the, 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 the regional entity or whoever is making the decision is making strategic investments around the, around the region considering the region as, a, as one entity. So, uh, so that's the parcel tax. So the, the tax is imposed irrespective of the use. So if it's a residential use or a commercial use, irrespective of the size of the parcel, so it could be a small parcel, large parcel, everybody pays the same uh, parcel tax. And that's uh, a limitation set on us by uh, state law. Uh, the next idea is uh, real estate transfer tax, and this is something that a lot of the cities in the, in the Bay Area already have. Uh, it ranges anywhere from a little bit more than a dollar per thousand uh, of the sale price. So if you sell it for, you know, sell your home for a uh, for million dollars, uh, then it would be 1.35% for uh, every thousand dollars. So it'll be 13.75 or 1335 in that particular case. So 1.35 per thousand of the sale price. Um, it ranges anywhere from $1.1 uh, per thousand in the East Bay to about $25 for every thousand uh, dollars in, in San Francisco. And San Francisco also uh, makes it a little bit more progressive where the rate rises as the value of the home sold rises as well. So um, higher pr uh, price properties pay a higher tax. Again, that you know, we, we've set the rate right now to reach the 100, 100 million figure. The vacant homes tax, and this is modeled on the Vancouver's uh, empty homes tax. The idea is that uh, we have a housing emergency. So if you own a second home or if you're uh, leasing out your home uh, through uh, short-term rentals, uh, that may not be in the best interest of the entire region. Uh, and so if you have a vacant home uh, that you haven't rented for more than six months in a particular year, uh, we would assess a 1% of your total assessed value as a tax every year. Uh, and again, the, there are a little bit more details on this in the action plans, but really it is modeled on almost entirely on the Vancouver model, which we think is, has been fairly successful because it raised about $30 million uh, last year and brought about 3,000 to 4,000 units online overnight without any cost to the, to the public into the rental market. Uh, and that is for a city that's smaller than uh, San Francisco. Uh, the final idea under property owners is uh, something that is similar in intent to the one before that, but is targeted more to the short-term rental market. Uh, and we see this as a particular issue in San Francisco and the wine country 
or wherever we don't have enough um, hotel rooms, but there's a large um, tourism industry. Um, and the idea there would be for the total amount of money that is paid to a homeowner, or sorry, the, the, the host uh, for every short-term rental, there would be a 25% charge uh, that would go into a regional pot to raise the 100 million. It could be lower than that to make it a little bit more feasible, but there are many, there are dozens of cities in the region that already charge this uh, fee. Uh, it ranges anything from 8% to 14%. I think San Francisco has 12%, Oakland, San Jose also have it. Uh, many of the jurisdictions in the peninsula uh, have a similar tax, but again, they're somewhere in the 10 to 12 percent uh, range. Uh, moving on to the, uh, the developer category, uh, the commercial linkage fee proposal that we've put forth is uh, similar in many ways to the local commercial linkage fees, uh, but uh, there, there's a key difference in the proposal that we have. First, it's regional, uh, and the second, that we are varying it by the size of the development and where it is located. So if you are located uh, outside a transit served area, we charge you a higher fee. If you're located in a jurisdiction that has a jobs housing balance that's higher than 1.5, we would charge you a higher fee. If you have a large development and we just put an arbitrary uh, threshold there for, if the development is for 100 workers, uh, we would charge you a higher fee unless you provide housing on site as well. Uh, and again, the fee schedule is in the uh, action plan, so you can look at that. But uh, if you apply this region-wide, uh, the, the, the commercial linkage fee would be anywhere between 2 to $8 a square foot, uh, which is lower than what most jurisdictions currently charge. So there are about uh, three dozen uh, jurisdictions in the Bay Area that already have a commercial linkage fee. Um, the thing to note here is that it is a one-time fee. It's not an annual recurring payment from the developer, but because we have new development every year occurring uh, at a steady pace, if, it, if that were the case, then we would have a steady stream of um, funding per year as well. The, the variation we have on that is a flat tax, so this is, very, this is more similar to the local taxes, so it would be a $5 per square foot flat tax uh, when you build new development anywhere in the region of any size. Um, and whether or not served by transit. So that's just a, a, a variation to show you what the, scale, what the amount of taxes would be if you applied it uniformly um, versus you applied it based on the location and the size of the development. Uh, we have a parallel proposal uh, for employers. So it's, again, this, the idea is that employers would pay a head tax, so that's a tax per uh, employee. Uh, and we still need to figure out if that is per FTE to get around the, the issue of contract workers or part-time workers. But uh, again, we would charge a higher fee if you are located outside a transit served area, if you're located in a jurisdiction with a, a jobs housing ratio that is um, more than 1.5, and if you have uh, more than 100 workers in any particular location, then you would be paying a higher fee. Uh, again, the range there is between $8 to $64 per head. Uh, as a comparison, uh, Oakland and San Jose already have a head tax, and they charge it as a business uh, tax to their uh, employers, and it ranges for San Jose anything from $72 to $100 um, per employee based on the sector. Uh, and in Oakland, I believe it's up to eight, uh, $350 ahead based on the uh, sector that you're um, looking at. There is, there were uh, a, a two uh, proposals in the Bay Area that were going to go to the November ballot for head taxes the, at the local level. One was in Cupertino, another one in Mountain View. I believe the Cupertino one was pulled back uh, based on pushback from large employers there. And that was the same case in Seattle. They passed, this council there passed the uh, head tax of about $225 a head, uh, but then rescinded it uh, the next, I think, week based on, um, because of the pushback from employers. So parallel to the, the developer commercial linkage fee, even for the head tax, we have a flat fee, so it's $30 per head uh, for every employee uh, in the region, small businesses, large businesses located anywhere um, in the region, uh, just to give you a sense of what, how that compares with the variable tax rates. 
For the employers, we also are proposing as an option a gross receipts tax. Uh, San Francisco passed one a few years ago. Uh, San Jose and Oakland also have it. Usually a gross receipts tax is uh, at a state level, so that's the most common. But some of the cities do uh, pass additional gross receipts tax in lieu of um, a, uh, a payroll tax. So San Francisco, for example, is phasing out the payroll tax and phasing in the gross receipts tax. And we use the same rates uh, that vary by sector and by size of the firm that San Francisco, ha San Francisco has for the proposal that we put forth. Again, we think a one twelfth of a cent uh, tax um, per, um, per dollar of gross receipts uh, for every uh, economic activity in the Bay Area could generate about $100 million of total revenue. Uh, the last one, and this is a little, uh, this is interesting. It, it, we, we added it, this option recently. It's a VMT tax uh, or a VMT fee on employers. So the difference between a VMT fee, uh, which is similar to a congestion pricing uh, system, is that A, for congestion pricing, you usually charge the driver. Uh, the fee for having the privilege of driving, let's say, in a central business district. Uh, in this case, if your employee drives to work, we'll charge you a fee. Um, and that's, again, a way f to get to the congestion and location issue for employers, but also to raise uh, new sources of revenue. Uh, the other difference is that it's not congestion-based, uh, so you don't have to be driving it during congestion hours. It just has to be a commute uh, trip. So uh, I'll, take a, I'll just pause there and see if there are any clarifying questions at this point. If you could hold your comments about the different ideas till the end. But if you have any qu clarifying questions, I can answer that. And then Ken will cover the rest of the ideas. Yes. Uh, just a question whether or not you've tried to think about the substitution effects that, there, that you might have in shrinking the tax base from some of these taxes. Uh, sorry, say that again. The substitution effect where, where the amount of the thing that you're taxing might decrease in response to the size of the tax? That's right. So that was, uh, you know, the, the policy outcome uh, for some of these ideas like the vacant homes tax and the commercial linkage, not the commercial linkage fee as much as uh, the VMT fee is that it would, we are hoping, also affect behavior. Uh, so the goal for, for example, the vacant homes tax is to raise zero revenue in the future because you want to bring all of the um, uh, all of the vacant homes to the rental market. So you're right. Some of them are there to change behavior, and over time they may not generate as much revenue if the policy is effective. Right. And just a quick clarifying question here. So for things like the... Um, um, the uh, commercial linkage fees, did these numbers reflect a fee that's, that's applied in the jurisdictions where, where there isn't already a, a, a linkage fee, or is this inclusive of those linkage fees? Is this, is this, to fill, this is just to fill the regional funding gap need that we've identified, is that correct? That's correct. So in many cases, as you mentioned, there are local fees as well. So for now, to calculate the $100 million, this would be on top of everything that the locals are charging. So this does not adjust currently for the local fee, uh, which is a good point. Uh, that still needs to be resolved uh, because different cities do have, for example, different commercial linkage fee, which may be higher or lower than what we're proposing. So how, did this, um, how is this compatible with that? Uh, but then there are also jurisdictions that don't, don't have the political will to pass some of the, uh, these fees and taxes at the local level, so this could provide um, the cover for, for us to charge it at the regional level. But you're right, we still have to reconcile this with the local fees that's already in place. Did you um, assume that there would be any exemptions, for instance, for tax-exempt users? Uh, yes. So, for example, for the parcel tax, we think there should be an exemption for low-income parcel owners. Uh, that was not the case with, with Measure AA. Uh, again, I didn't go over those details, but where we think there should be a, an exemption, we've included that in the action plans. Uh, so, for example, even with the commercial linkage fee, there could be an exemption for nonprofit organizations and government entities. Um, but that is an open question. For now, we did not uh, include those exemptions in the calculation, but that's a question identified in the action plans. 
question. Just as a follow-up to the question around the, the relationship to the local fees and taxes, I mean, I think there's a real threat that if you impose a regional fees and taxes that a lot of localities will then do away with their own, and so you'll have, you know, you won't really have the net gain. You'll just have the substitution of that fee for a regional fee. Right. And again, that needs to be reconciled. Um, you know, once we have... Uh, for now, we're looking for direction from you in terms of which concept uh, makes more sense. Uh, we definitely want to have at least one source of revenue per column, uh, but uh, I think we need to dig deeper to uh, figure out some of those questions as a next step. Sorry, Bakrat. Um, can you explain how the key works on here? Oh, uh, so... Uh, so like we said, so for all of these ideas, there will be, we will, we will, we will need some sort of enabling legislation at the state level uh, because some sort of a regional entity would need to be enabled to impose these taxes. Um, and then for some of them, we might even need voter approval, uh, like with measure AA, which was a parcel tax, which was passed in two, uh, 2016. So we are still working on, you know, what that, uh, what each of the, ideas that we've come up with need. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the two variations there is either you need a simple majority or a two-thirds majority. So for the state legislature, it's the same thing. For the voters, it's the same thing. And eventually, we want to, we want to bring back the information so that it informs your decisions on which of these ideas will need a state legislation with two-thirds majority versus simple majority, and then if and whether, whether or not you need a voter approval and whether that will be a two-thirds or a simple majority. So we still need to do that work. Amy. And I assume you'll highlight which needs both the right. state legislative vote and the vote of the people. That's correct. All right, that was a lot, and there's more. Um, <laughs> so stay tuned. Um, and we, we do want to emphasize that this is the, this is the first uh, bite at the apple you have. Um, if you have questions today as you're hearing the presentations, write them down on your post-its, pass them in. We'd love to get that information. Between now and the October meeting when this will be brought back to you, um, if you have questions, comments, what, what have you, don't hesitate to email us because we really want to get your input as we're doing more work on the proposals. So the next item under the local government column uh, would call for the state legislature to enact a law that would require local governments in the Bay Area to pool 17.5% of their future property tax growth increments from all development starting in 2020. And again, this is based upon the $100 million figure that we're trying to reach. So it would be $100 million every year that would be generated by jurisdictions doing this. It's based uh, in part upon an existing statute that's existed since the 1970s in the Twin Cities region, uh, where the Metropolitan Council, which is the MPO for Minneapolis-St. Paul, has revenue-raising authority. And it's almost uh, sort of the opposite of Prop 13, or the fiscalization of land use. They have a regional framework where they defiscalize land use, and they redistribute uh, the top 40% of property tax uh, growth across jurisdictions in their region based upon the need. What we're proposing, again, aiming for that $100 million annual figure is comparatively modest, 17.5%, and we're saying that it would go toward housing. Next slide. So redevelopment and the loss of redevelopment is something you're all very aware of. Um, with this proposal, uh, it's sort of a redevelopment 2.0 proposal that would call for a couple of things. One would be that the legislature would pass a law, or the legislature would pass a law and would require, among other things, that cities and counties set aside 27.5% of redevelopment revenue for affordable housing. Uh, it would differ from redevelopment 1.0 in a couple of respects. Um, special districts and school funding would be left untouched. They would not be part of this. Um, and it would apply tax increment financing to transit priority areas. So these are the state-recognized transit areas uh, that have also been uh, recognized in SB 35, uh, in SB uh, 827. It was the geography that was used. So it's using that same geography that's used statewide uh, related to regional planning. 
It would be the mechanism for redevelopment 2.0 under this proposal, and it would uh, provide for 100, uh, again, $100 million annually. Next slide. The California Surplus Land Act, as many of you probably know, requires that uh, government entities make surplus land available for affordable housing. They're supposed to provide a notification when they have surplus land uh, that they're no longer going to use and, and make it potentially available for affordable housing. That's actually a requirement of the One Barrier Grant Program that MTC has now. That requirement only goes so far. It's a notification requirement and it's through self-certification. What we're proposing in this proposal is that for a, with a target of $100 million a year and looking at the value of land uh, based upon uh, 50 units per acre, so fairly conservative, that 20 acres of land would be made available for affordable housing within the region annually uh, to drive down the cost of affordable housing. This is one where there's a lot of work that would need to happen in terms of how those lands would be identified, what the mechanism would be. Um, these are lands that could be uh, under the ownership of local government, uh, could be transit agencies, uh, other public agencies. But the idea is to build upon the Surplus Land Act and what it calls for in terms of notification and really create a program that moves land toward affordable housing in the region. Next slide. The next one is easy. No, none of this is easy. Uh, but th the next one is, is fairly easy to explain in that it is a regional sales tax, again with a target of $100 million generated annually. Uh, this proposal would call for a tax of one sixteenth cent applied across the nine counties. Uh, so in that sense, a fairly modest increase, but one that would be applied throughout the Bay Area um, and would require state legislation to do this. Again, it would generate $100 million each year. Um, a lot more work would need to occur in terms of how this could advance, um, but that's, that's the general idea. And now the last one is general ob obligation bonds, bonds being a loan, um, using GO bonds as a way to raise money through a regional housing entity for affordable housing that would be reauthorized every five years and would generate $100 million every year. Um, I think on this item, it's worth noting that a lot of the items on the page require the creation of a regional housing entity of some sort. To really stand up uh, these different mechanisms is going to take a, a location, an entity to make this possible. Some of these would be easier to do in terms of implementation. Many of them are challenging in terms of the legislature. Um, but nonetheless, it's going to create a, an organizing mechanism to move them forward. So that will be part of the discussion as we advance this discussion. Uh, next slide. Philanthropy is a relatively new source of revenue in the region. Uh, it's represented here at CASA uh, through the San Francisco Foundation and CZI as one of the preeminent uh, efforts moving forward in the region. Uh, we think it's an opportunity for the region to uh, leverage different funds, uh, including those that would come from the various sectors that are identified on the page. Um, I'm sure we're going to be talking more about that in the future. Next slide. So one additional important piece of work that still needs to happen with whatever CASA advances through the compact in terms of revenue is how to spend the money. Uh, as uh, Vikrant mentioned earlier on in this presentation, we're working off a couple of different figures. We're working off the, the amount of money that's needed to fund the affordable housing gap itself. Uh, your discussions have had to do with a whole range of things. The basic framework of this compact is going to be the three Ps. What we have up here on the screen is one potential way you could go. We think there's a lot more work that is needed here. But one potential way to go could be to have 60% of the funding go toward the production of affordable housing itself. 
Um, it could be through grants and financing. Uh, we could prioritize project and transit priority areas and high opportunity areas. Uh, we could tie it to some of the workforce training programs that have been discussed as part of this effort. We could look at the acquisition of land. We've also talked a lot about affordable housing preservation um, and preserving the existing affordable housing stock that, that exists here in the region, either in the market that's currently not deed restricted or affordable housing projects that are going to lose their HUD financing in the future. Um, that could be one of the areas where this funding goes. Perhaps 20% uh, is the right percentage. Perhaps it's not. Tenant protection services in terms of protecting folks from displacement. Uh, right now, we don't have money for that. So how much of this money should go toward the protection of our most vulnerable folks in terms of displacement uh, and displacement of their communities? Maybe 10% is the right figure. Perhaps it's not. And then lastly, looking at production, uh, there's been a lot of work that's gone into really trying to look at how impact fees at the local level could be capped or limited or rolled back, how we could streamline the process to get more housing built. But if local jurisdictions are going to take a hit in terms of the amount of money they are taking in relative to housing, and given that so many have enterprise programs to fund their basic infrastructure around housing, we would have to figure out a way to backfill that because for many jurisdictions, if it's not addressed, they won't be able to do that or do it as well as we are proposing. So again, there's going to be a lot more discussion that you all will be having on this moving forward. This is just kind of a first look. One uh, source of revenue that we have, uh, but that still requires the approval of the Bay Area Toll Authority, is infrastructure-related financing uh, for BATA, which is associated with MTC. Um, as you all know, uh, Financing the cost of housing is in part significantly related to the cost of infrastructure. Uh, what this infrastructure bank could potentially support is the financing through patient loans of infrastructure. It could be for sewers, it could be for water, sidewalks. A lot of the costs of housing and affordable housing that isn't directly housing per se, but is a big par part of the cost of housing. Uh, we think it could lower financing costs, um, hopefully accelerate implementation, particularly for projects that are deeply affordable. Uh, it could make our projects here in the region uh, more competitive for statewide funds such as the ASIC fund, um, and could result in more affordable units because it just creates a larger pot of money uh, for the advancement of housing in the region. Next slide. So. Uh, next steps. This is the first look at proposals, uh, and we're going to open it up for further discussion in a moment. Uh, we're going to bring it back to you in October after bringing this same general presentation to the steering committee next week. In November, we're going to have a discussion uh, with our commission about transportation funding conditioning for housing outcomes, and the infrastructure bank will go to the Bay Area Toll Authority. And then in November and December, we're going to have a telephone poll to see uh, what people in the region might think of all these ideas. So, Steve had his light on. I saw it go off. Mike has his on. 